Hello and welcome to Women of the Middle East podcast. This podcast relates the realities of Arab women and their rich and diverse experiences. It aims to present the multiplicity of women's voices, and it wishes to break cultural stereotypes about women of the Middle East, as well as educate and empower the younger generation of Middle Eastern women who were stripped of their historical reference and weren't necessarily raised to believe in their agency and power to create their own destiny. I'm Amal Malki. I'm a feminist, scholar, and educator. I'm also the author of Arab Women in Arab News, Old Stereotypes and New Media. I created this podcast to be an extension and an update of the book and its main topics. Hello and welcome to the second episode in which I will start by taking a universal approach towards defining Arab women, positioning them into a bigger frame of reference to establish proper acquaintance. The Arab woman is a flesh and blood human being living in 22 countries and territories among some 340 million people spanning Northern Africa and Western Asia. She's illiterate and she lives in abject poverty. She's blessed with unimaginable wealth, enjoying near universal literacy. She lives under the rule of governments that are oppressive and governments that are more enlightened. She's a sister, wife, mother, daughter, grandmother, aunt and cousin. She's the vital tissue binding her immediate and extended family together. She's educated with doctoral and medical degrees. She holds titles in universities and labors on the streets. She works as a teacher in commerce and the crafts, and also in science, engineering, technology, banking, literature, journalism, and the arts. She's an uneducated housewife and an educated one. She's an exhausted modern professional wife and mother balancing family and work. She's a destitute divorcee and a widow with little family support. She's a divorcee or widow who enjoys overwhelming family support. She's a young school girl who leaves for school each day with hope and confidence in what she can be. She's a young school girl who must bring courage and resolve to the classroom because her educational rights are ignored and sometimes attacked. She lives in rich families and poor families, and families facing cultural, political, and psychological pressures. She's politically quiet and politically aware and active. Her womanhood makes little difference to her identity in the world. Her womanhood makes a great deal of difference. She cares passionately about the future of her children. Does this sound more of how you would describe women everywhere? Well, yes. The Arab woman is no different from women everywhere. If you remember, this episode began on the premise of universality, in which I'm positioning Arab women. Yet I'm doing that without losing the specificities of these women's realities. At the heart of it is diversity. Diversity is what makes women very unique within the geographical context of the Middle East. I chose the Middle East as a geographical, but moreover as an epistemological reference, acknowledging its colonial baggage. But for the lack of a better reference, I will continue using the term to talk about the wealth of women's experiences in an area that covers Middle East and North Africa, and also making references to Iran and Turkey. Also, while the Arab woman definition gives a false ethnic homogeneity that transcends religious and sectarian affiliation, the Middle Eastern woman, I believe, does more than that. Does more than that by transcending religious as well as ethnic limitations to include Arabs and non-Arabs, Muslims and non-Muslims. In the next segment, I will zoom in to talk about how COVID-19 has impacted the lives of women in the Middle East. COVID-19 taught us many lessons. I've written recently in a local newspaper about these lessons and stressed on the realization that we're all in it together, regardless of the fact that many of us aren't on the receiving end of the same social or financial privileges 
The pandemic exposed the inequalities in our communities that were already there but have been heightened by either the lockdown or other living aspects that have changed and have been challenged due to the pandemic. We were introduced to the most vulnerable and disadvantaged, those who didn't have the luxury of social distancing, those whom in losing their daily wages have lost their livelihoods, and those whose abuse intensified during the lockdown. During the pandemic, the intersection between the individual and the collective spaces have become bigger, and we cannot turn a blind eye anymore to these injustices. It is our duty as groups and individuals to expose, address, and stop all practices of injustice in our communities, to leave it a better place after we're gone. I will talk to Dr. Hadir Qazaz, who is the MENA Regional Gender Coordinator at Oxfam International. Dr. Hadil Qazaz has more than 20 years of experience in international development and gender justice. She has worked extensively in the Middle East, Africa, Central Asia, and Canada in areas of gender democracy, democratization processes, integrity, and poverty elevation. She has worked with international organizations, academic institutions, and local governments. She has deep knowledge of civil society in the Middle East, as well as the challenges and potentials of the region. My name is Hadil Qazaz. I'm uh, the Regional Gender Justice Coordinator in uh, Oxfam International. Um, Oxfam has offices in 10 countries in the Middle East and North Africa, and I work specifically on the gender justice issues. This covers uh, women economic empowerment, violence against women, women peace and security, uh, women political participation and women leadership. The challenges that women go through aren't necessarily new, but the pandemic have kind of brought it to the surface and highlighted it. What have you been covering and uh, what areas you've been covering as well? As you know, Oxfam is a humanitarian and a developmental organization, meaning that we uh, usually have responses for crisis and for situations uh, that uh, um, people find themselves and so it could be wars, uh, natural disasters or pandemics. So in that sense, as soon as the COVID-19 crisis started in the region, uh, we had rapid responses uh, in all our, on all the countries we work on, where we developed uh, 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 country response plans together with the teams on the ground. Uh, we made sure that when the government governments started the response for COVID-19, while women are the first respondents and they are usually the first to face the pandemic, they were rarely uh, seen uh, in the response committees or in the groups that uh, are assigned uh, to uh, to follow up on these issues. So we paid a close attention, close eye on into these things, in, in making sure to. Uh, collect um, what we call gender segregated data to understand how the pandemic is affecting women and uh, women and girls in particular and what women are doing and what are the issues that uh, raised as you said the, usually women are disadvantaged uh, but the pandemic just showed how much they are disadvantaged uh, so um, uh, immediately there were two issues that appeared uh, to the service one is uh, the burden on unpaid care work and the uh, how much women have to do, especially to uh, to respond to the pandemic. So not only the uh, the the chores at home increased, the care for the children who were homeschooling increased, uh, the care for the sick and elderly and disabled increased, the the um, the family staying at home and uh, you know needing more attention and cleaning and cooking and all of this. Uh, the other issue, which was also a, a global phenomenon, was related to the violence against women and how women who were kept in, inside the house with their abusers sometimes and couldn't seek any help because of the uh, procedures around the pandemic. Uh, so Oxfam published two reports about the burden of unpaid care work. And uh, also we are working on the ground to find the uh, immediate responses like small grants uh, for uh, civil society organizations uh, who are uh, who were able to put together some kind of responses, com especially community responses. So in Palestine, in Tunisia, in Morocco, in Jordan, 
we had immediately mobilized some funds for the civil society organizations to, to respond to the violence against women. In Jordan, in particular, we worked very hard to secure access and buses because you know how uh, uh, the governments issued some kind of permits for movement during closure, closure and lockdown. Uh, but they didn't see uh, the pandemic of violence against women as an excuse for movement. Uh, so our office in Jordan in particular helped securing, uh, contacting authorities and uh, supporting uh, our partners to get access to the women who are victims of violence. We made sure that the, all our response plans have gender responses. Um, working on uh, women economic resiliency, reaching out to informal workers, for example, in some countries where uh, domestic workers found themselves without jobs, uh, responding to violence against women. At the same time, uh, we were very quick to uh, mobilize, uh, to invite actually civil society organizations in the region to come together to coordinate amongst themselves. So together with the UN Women with the Gvina um, uh, some some international organizations like Vinfo, Gvina Gvina, Oxfam, uh, we came together and uh, we had established a network of more than forty women organizations to coordinate their responses. What happens to the women in countries that don't have an active civil society, society and don't have NGOs? Depending on the context, there are different ways of working. And uh, in some contexts where the civil society is very weak or cannot, uh, there are no uh, civil society organizations. Um, Oxfam uh, helps in uh, forming what we call community committees. These community committees are uh, formed uh, at the community level from people who live in these disadvantaged communities, for example, uh, communities who lack access to water and sanitation, or uh, organizations who lack access to uh, uh, protection services. So we form these committees and we work through them. In other places where we need to coordinate with local governments, we do coordinate with them uh, to secure access to humanitarian services or to reach out to uh, the, uh, remote areas where nobody can be there. Uh, at the same time, um, we we strengthen the civil society organizations because also we believe that they are more sustainable than us. They will stay after we leave if we are in a certain location or a certain country because they know the context better. Um, as you rightly said, for example, during the lockdown and closures, um, it was very hard for women, for example, to access uh, Sharia courts or to access uh, uh, lawyers uh, to ask for uh, divorce or custodies. Uh, so uh, we, we, through our uh, networks, we help secure some kind of access uh, to these women, um, especially uh, in places like I told you the this network which we coordinated. Uh, uh, women were able to exchange uh, information and knowledge about what can be done. In Egypt, for example, they were very quick to activate uh, online courts uh, where uh, if there's an urgent need for a hearing, uh, the, 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 um, the judge can meet uh, with, the, uh, with the victim or with the person online and uh, solve a case. Uh, in uh, in places like in Palestine, for example, where uh, the Sharia courts were were closed, uh, the civil society organizations we work with helped women to seek shelter shelters or to get services online. Uh, in Lebanon, where we um, uh, our partners produced online materials on coping mechanisms on how women can deal with a violent situation what kind of uh, coping mechanisms and responses they can do for themselves. Were you able to reach uh, to uh, Syrian refugees, um, women refugees, and how about uh, Yemeni women? Our two largest operations in the region are actually in Yemen and Syria. Uh, so uh, in addition, we help Syrian refugees in, in Lebanon and in Jordan. COVID-19 in these vulnerable situations where uh, people cannot even practice social uh, distancing or uh, uh, cannot uh, have access to enough water to maintain sanitation and clean uh, wash their hands, etc. So wherever um, 
wherever we are, uh, we help the refugees to secure the basic needs, uh, including access to water and sanitation, including access to protection services. In some areas where the refugees were suffering from stigma, they were attacked because they are refugees. They were blamed. Some in some countries, they were blamed just like accused of of uh, communicating the pandemic which is not true in uh, Yemen in particular is very very tough place as you know and uh, uh, it, uh, uh, for our teams on the ground it's not only the pandemic they have to struggle also with the cholera with the rain with the floods with the uh, of course the different security issues we couldn't have access to the offices and uh, for some time we had uh, our teams working from home and trying to help as much as they can uh, so uh, it is navigating very very difficult situations especially for women uh, but uh, in general for for the whole population and uh, as i told you depending on the context that's where how we work in uh, in jordan for example we work with the Syrian refugees in different ways, uh, but uh, we have a very successful project in Jordan focusing on recycling and uh, the women uh, in the refugee camp of Zatari. For the sake of our audience who don't necessarily uh, know about what women go through, if you had to list some of the main issues that came uh, and that you had to deal with. What would those issues be? Well, actually, I will uh, borrow and use the discussions that uh, happened in the network that I told you about of more than 40 women organizations from the region coming together uh, for, in response for COVID-19. Uh, the discussions showed that there are four major issues. And these four major issues are uh, the uh, women access to sexual and reproductive health. As you know, when the uh, pandemic starts, the health departments were overwhelmed with the responses. And uh, many of the uh, access, for example, access to women health issues, to contraceptions, to uh, anything related to it it, it, it was pushed to the back. And uh, we found that this means that women are suffering a lot in their bodies also from the uh, effect of, of this uh, lack of access. The second one is, a, and I'm not saying them in the, uh, like on the which is most important. I mean, not in a priority issues, but these are the four issues that were discussed. The second one was uh, the uh, economic resilience. Uh, meaning that, and you know that around the region, uh, we, ha we, we live in a very unequal region where uh, majority are poor and marginalized, but also there are very few who, who have high level of wealth and the distribution is very problematic. At the same time, uh, many people, like the majority of populations in our region, live uh, day to day. And uh, if you ask them to be isolated for two months, uh, uh, staying at home without access to income, this means that you are killing them. So basically what we heard in the region over and over again, if I don't die from the pandemic, I will die from hunger. So it's this either way. Uh, for women, this is in particular very important because most women, uh, we, as you may know, we have one of the lowest economic participation of women in the world, in our region, like usually below 20% in all countries. And therefore, many women are either in informal sector or unpaid care, uh, unpaid uh, family work. And these two sectors are uh, usually... Um, they don't have any access to social benefits. So even in some countries where it was possible to uh, to distribute some hands, uh, some cash or some uh, uh, social benefits, uh, women, uh, even women who are heads of the households, who are the only breadwinners, they couldn't access this kind of, uh, of uh, supports. The third issue was violence against women, and we talked about it in a, a little bit, but uh, actually uh, there were different forms of violence, including violence online, uh, digital violence, uh, women were attacked for uh, because they were staying home. Uh, they used social media, but the family members also noticed them more. They followed them more. They saw their movements. We heard the horrible stories about 
uh, young women on TikTok or uh, on social media and how they were abused because uh, the family sort of discovered what they are doing. There were different types of bullying. There was, of course, the, the domestic violence, the intimate uh, um, partner violence, as well as violence against younger girls. Uh, the, the fourth one is uh, anything related to uh, uh, women based on security and uh, access to security in general. And this is especially valid and uh, relevant to uh, countries like war, war countries, war torn countries, uh, where uh, while people had to be in isolation and locked down because of the pandemic, uh, their homes were bombarded. That's why uh, Oxfam supported uh, the Stop the War. A campaign, uh, the UN campaign, and uh, uh, ceasefire, immediate ceasefire for all conflicts, especially in Yemen, Syria, the Gaza Strip. Um, and uh, of course, the women uh, are most disadvantaged in any conflict uh, area. But we also talk not only about open conflicts, we are talking about security issues uh, due to um, government's oppression due to uh, how governments uh, treat their citizens in some cases in some countries where uh, there is more surveillance on women, not only on all citizens, but especially on women activists. And maybe you heard about Egypt and what happened to the young women who were um, imprisoned because of uh, practicing their self-expression on uh, online media or on, or on digital platforms. So uh, these are the four issues we are de developing uh, position papers and specific recommendations on how to address these four issues and what needs to be put in place uh, to, to protect women immediately, but also uh, on the long run to prepare them uh, for the, uh, what, what may come after the um, COVID-19. Uh, when will you be done with those papers and how will you disseminate them? Uh, so for uh, for Oxfam papers, uh, we did uh, some work on uh, uh, unpaid care work, women in informal sector, and they are available. I can share some with you. Uh, for the uh, uh, feminist groups in the MENA region, we are working on them right now, and they will should be ready by the end of the month where we will disseminate them widely and try to reach out to decision makers at government level, at the Arab League level, uh, at the UN level. So um, there will be uh, an advocacy plan attached to, to these papers as well. I am posing to give the next topic I discuss with Dr. Hadil what it deserves. Attention. Violence against women, or what the UN has called shadow pandemic, is a serious issue before, during, and will remain after the pandemic. I will focus on this issue in other episodes, but here I ask Dr. Hadil about the factors contributing to exacerbation of this issue and their intervention to tackle it. The shadow pandemic, because uh, also the statistics, the information we have so far, not only in our region, but globally, shows that women who are suffering from the violence against women are even more than the uh, women who suffer from the pandemic. And it is something that is happening everywhere. Uh, it's happening um, because of many issues, because of the patriarchal nature of societies, but also because of women economic dependency, because of lack of services, because, as you said, uh, 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 women issues were always kept in the private sphere and they were not put into the public sphere. Um, uh, so I would say that uh, there are different interventions, uh, at least from Oxfam points of view. Uh, we have four areas of intervention that we work on and intersect with the, uh, at, at any point. At, at any point, um, one of uh, the first one is uh, related to the individual. Uh, so the women awareness of what what violence means and that what they are suffering of uh, is violence and how they can report it, what they can do about it. Uh, there is the formal system. Uh, which means the, anything related to the laws, regulations, policies, uh, uh, court systems, uh, how to report it, how to uh, seek services for it. Uh, 
then anything related to what we call the informal system, uh, meaning anything related to the social norms, to uh, the social media, to the jokes that we exchange, the songs that we listen to, to the sub operas and series and TV shows that we uh, listen to, anything that re-emphasize and recreates uh, the violence against women in, in our day-to-day, -day, actually. And the fourth area is uh, what we call the organization, the systemic meaning, how women can come together from the individual to the collective. And you asked me uh, if we work only with the civil society organizations, and actually we encourage any group of women who come together, even informally. Uh, there are social movements, there are working groups across the region, younger women, um, uh, come to mind, there is a group in, in Palestine, for example, called the uh, Talat, uh, a young young feminist group who, who decided to uh, go out to the streets and protest against violence against women. There is a group in Jordan, there is everywhere actually in the MENA region. There are different groups of in, uh, what we call social movements or informal groups uh, who come together and protest against uh, the violence against women. As you can see, these things are not separated from each other. They inform each other, they emphasize each other's work. So basically, uh, what, can, uh, what the uh, uh, individual can inform the collective, can inform the uh, changes in social norms, what we call social norms, uh, and info, uh, it uh, also inform the changes in policy and regulations. In most of our countries in the region, uh, our laws and regulations are outdated. They are very old. They are not uh, um, up to date. Uh, even the new, the modernized laws are related mainly to uh, market systems and investments, but not to social uh, uh, laws and not things that relate that relates to family law or. Because most of in most of our countries, these are referred to the Sharia law, laws and uh, not modernized sort of. We have a project, a multi-country project that just started in the region, focusing on violence against women in conflict. So looking at the complexity of violence in conflict areas, as well as um, uh, uh, looking into services. Referral systems, uh, how if, if a woman is a victim of violence, how she can access services uh, within her community, uh, what are the availability of shelters, what are the availability of uh, counseling, legal uh, counseling, psychological counseling. All of these things are addressed at a, a multi-layered uh, way. And they, as I told you, they reinform each other and reinforce each other because we believe that no single entry to solving this shadow pandemic. We have advanced in addressing racism, addressing, addressing uh, a different kind of uh, discrimination, but we didn't progress enough to address patriarchy and to address the uh, uh, abuse and subordination of women. When we reach that stage, I think many things will, will be different. Many things will, will shift around and we would live in a bit better societies, in more viable and more sustainable societies where women are uh, and men have enjoy, enjoy life with dignity and social justice. Exactly. I, I strongly agree with you. Um, unfortunately, the norms uh, as they exist right now enable the aggressor on the basis of um, gender uh, differences. Dr. Hadil, um, thank you so much. This has been very uh, informative, very interesting. It gives an idea about um, the main issues that uh, face women um, uh, and in a region, um, regardless of it's a, uh, you know, during the pandemic or not. Uh, the pandemic just brought to those uh, issues to the surface. Of course, the economic issues exist before and will exist after. It just uh, intensified it uh, somehow. Thanks for this opportunity. I think what we learned from the pandemic was uh, that the current situation of inequality, injustice, lack of gender justice cannot continue. 
it is destroying us and it's it will kill us all so basically uh if the pandemic uh showed us something it showed us the importance of social justice of women being able to live a life full of dignity of how important it is to have social uh, protection we in oxfam advocate for a minimum income because uh this inequality cannot be addressed if people are starving, if people don't have access to uh, basic needs of uh, sanitation, of hygiene, of uh, uh, if people are not able to be safe in their homes. So all of this has to, to end. And I think, in my opinion, uh, gender justice is the answer and solution to many of the things that the pandemic inten intensified. Uh, which are issues of inequality, injustice, and lack of security. That's it for this episode. Remember, you can write to me on amal at amalmalki.com. And if you have a story to tell, you can always send a voice note. And I'm more than happy to connect with you and include you in the next episodes. Until then, take care and stay safe.